So I'm going to do a review of basically how the CNS develops, and then we'll give a summary of the malformations of the central nervous system. There are really many. I'll try to highlight some of the key aspects. So let's start by remembering that the primordium of the central nervous system, the embryonic primordium of the central nervous system is a neural tube. Remember the neural tube forms from the third week of development through the process of neurulation. Once neurulation has occurred, we have a structure that's called the neural tube. This neural tube is the one that gives rise to the central nervous system, which is both brain as well as the spinal cord. After this neural tube has been formed, the neural tube divides into some swellings. The cranial two thirds of the neural tube divides into some swellings. Those swellings are the primary brain vesicles. They represent the site of the future brain. The caudal one third of the neural tube doesn't develop such swellings, and that caudal one third of the neural tube is the one that will become the spinal cord. So understand that even though brain is short and the spinal cord is long, the brain takes the lion's share of the neural tube because it has a bigger mass. The tube has both walls as well as cavity. The cavities of the neural tube will become this ventricular system of the brain, the CSF spaces of the brain, while the wall of the neural tube will become the tissues of the brain and spinal cord. There are three primary swellings that form at the region of the future brain. The swelling of the forebrain is called prosencephalon. The swelling of the midbrain is called mesencephalon, and the swelling of the hindbrain is called rhombencephalon. These primary brain swellings later develop to secondary brain swellings. In as much as we have only three primary brain swellings, we have five secondary brain swellings. The secondary brain swellings are this way. So the this rhombencep sorry the prosencephalon, which is the primary brain swelling, gives us two types of swellings. We have the telencephalon and dencephalon. The telencephalon is paired, but the dencephalon is not paired. So it's only one at the center but the telencephalon are paired. We have right and left telencephalic vesicles. The midbrain swelling mesencephalon doesn't change. So it remains as still mesencephalon. It is both a primary as well as a secondary brain swelling. Then we have this chamber, rhombencephalon, which is the hindbrain swelling. This one divides into two. The upper part is called metencephalon and the lower part is called myelencephalon. Although the walls may segment, the cavity of rhombencephalon does not really segment and it remains as a single unit, the cavity of rhombencephalon is that one. So now we have uh, five secondary brain swellings from the three primary brain swellings. These five secondary brain swellings are the ones that will now give us the various derivatives that eventually become the brain. So understand again that the cavity of the tube will give us the ventricular system, while the wall of the tube gives us the brain tissue. Therefore, we can state the derivatives of each of them. So the wall of telencephalon give rise to the cerebral hemisphere, while the cavity of telencephalon gives rise to the lateral ventricles. Remember there are two telencephalic vesicles, so there are two hemispheres as well, 
and there are two lateral ventricles as well, one in each hemisphere. The wall of the encephalon gives us the thalamus, hypothalamus, subthalamus, and the pineal body, just like the components of the encephalon that we know. The cavity of the encephalon gives us the third ventricle of the brain. Coming down here, the wall of mesencephalon gives rise to the midbrain, while the cavity gives rise to the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvia. And down here, the wall of metencephalon gives us pons as well as cerebellum, while the wall of myelencephalon gives rise to the medulloblongata. The cavity of rhombencephalon gives rise to the fourth ventricle of the brain. So those are the derivatives of the secondary brain vesicles. Remember the lower one third of the neurotube doesn't form those swellings and that will become the spinal cord. Well, remember as the spinal cord develops as well, that the spinal cord grows slowly compared to the vertebral column. And that is why the spinal cord shortens as we grow older. Okay, having said so, we can now review the phases of development of the human central nervous system. The human central nervous system develops in four key phases. The first phase is the phase of dorsal induction. The phase of dorsal induction is the phase of neurotube formation, is a period of neurulation. Remember, there is primary neurotube from primary neurulation and secondary neurotube from secondary neurulation. Whether the neurotube has been formed from primary neurotube or secondary neurotube doesn't matter. Eventually, what we have is a neurotube. So this neurotube is the one that will give rise to the central nervous system. After the neurotube has been formed, we have the phase of ventral induction. The phase of ventral induction is a phase of formation of the vesicles of the brain that lead to the segmentation and the cleavage of the brain. So we have the primary brain vesicles forming and then secondary brain vesicles forming as I've outlined. And remember the telencephalon even has right and left vesicle. That is what we call cleavage, separation of the right and the left hemispheres. Once that has happened, then we have a phase of neuronal proliferation and migration. Understand that neurons migrate from deeper zones to the peripheral zones of the neural tube. And so if cell bodies of neurons are coming from deeper zones near the ependymal lining, near this canal, near the lumen of the neural tube, as they go out, they'll be taking cell bodies of neurons out and that therefore leads to the formation of gray matter on the outer margin of the CNS. That gray matter is what we call the cerebral cortex. Therefore, neuronal migration is the mechanism of cerebral cortex development, is the mechanism of cortical development. Therefore, this period of neuronal proliferation and migration is a period of cortical development. Last but not least, we have the period of axonal myelination. This is a period when we have now myelin sheath forming in various parts of the central nervous system. Neuronal myelination is a very organized process that occurs in the nervous system. It begins from some specific sites and ends in some specific sites. We may not have to give the order in this particular review, but there's an order. Importantly, understand that uh, most myelination will be over by the second year after birth, which means that myelination will begin before birth, but it's completed two years after birth. Great, having said so, we will now look at the disorders of the central nervous system. It's much easier to classify these disorders 
in some categories. We will look at disorders of dorsal induction, which are disorders of neural tube formation. So we call them neural tube defects. We'll also look at disorders of ventral induction. These are disorders of forebrain cleavage. In simple terms, disorders of separation of the right and the left hemispheres. Then you have disorders of cortical development. Disorders of cortical development are disorders that arise due to abnormal proliferation, migration, and even organization of the cerebral cortex. We will not look at disorders of myelination, uh, largely because they are less anatomical, but more physiological. But even so, um, most demyelinating diseases are acquired disorders, not necessarily congenital disorders. Yes, they are congenital disorders, but they'll be largely functional or image-based, MRI-based, rather than what we can teach in gross anatomy. So I've chosen to not include them here, but I have chosen to include some entities which have a profound anatomical um, significance, the posterior posa malformations, these are malformations that affect the brain stem and cerebellum. And generally, we'll also talk about the disorders that affect the ventricular system. So let's begin with the disorders of dorsal induction. Disorders of neurotube closure. They can affect the spinal cord or the cranium. The ones that affect the spinal cord are called cranial bifida. So you most likely already know about the spinal bifidas can be occulta, or can have meningocele, or can have myelomeningocele. Other than that, you may also have uh, rachischesis, where rachischesis could be partial like that, or can affect the whole of the neural axis, and we call that cranial rachischesis. It's an open neural plate. You may also have I may not necessarily include here. Now we can talk about the neurotube defects that affect the brain. Uh, we also have what you call cephalocils. Cephalocils are protrusions through defects on the skull and dura mater. These protrusions can be large or small. Um, they may contain CSF pockets as a cyst, then we call them meningocil, or they can include uh, brain tissue within that cyst, and we call that encephalocil. So you have meningocils and encephalocils. We can also give them names depending on the region they affect. Like this one is affecting the occipital region. So we call this occipital encephalocele. It's too big to be a meningocele, most likely. This is a frontonasal type, even that's a frontonasal uh, encephalocele. You can see CSF's pocket and also brain tissue there. These ones are still occipital encephalocele. The first two, this one is phenoidal meningocele. We don't see brain tissue but we see a protrusion of CSF through the sphenoid bone there, the base of skull. Great, this one shows us uh, pulling or downward herniation of the posterior cranial fossa structures through the foramen magnum. We call this Chiari malformation. There are different types of Chiari malformations. There's one that we call Chiari 2 malformation. In Chiari 2 malformation, the posterior fossa structures are pulled down because there is a spinal dystrophic disorder that is fixing the spinal cord down. So the spinal cord may not be able to hang freely as it should. And so it applies traction on the posterior cranial fossa structures. Actually, it applies traction on the brain 
but the posterior crane fossa structure is the one most affected. So it will present with the tonsillar herniation, as you can see here. The cerebellar tonsils go down through the foramen magnum. Also, the brainstem goes down through foramen magnum. There's a way the shape of the fourth ventricle will now appear because of that traction. Okay, so that is Chiari 2 malformation based on the fact that there's a spinal dystrophic disorder causing the posterior cranial fossa structures to be pulled down. And that is why it's still considered part of a neurotube disorder because the mechanisms are because of defective neurotube closure. We can go to disorders of ventral induction, disorders of separation of the right and the left hemisphere. So you may have abnormal fusion of the right and the left hemisphere, or we can say it an abnormal separation, depending on what you want to understand out of it. We expect that right and the left hemisphere to be fully separated, except at the region of the corpus callosum that is joining them. Now, if some parts of the lobes of the cerebrum are joined, then we have issues with that one. And so to start us off, we have what we call prosen, <coughs> holoprosencephaly. These are holoprosencephaly malformations. In holoprosencephaly, you have the right and the left hemispheres being abnormally joined. As you can see there, there's no separation. These are disorders of cleavage. This one, there's separation, but the ventricle is a single one and continuous the spaces as well. Even in this particular image, you can see monoventricle. So it's a single ventricle. There's no septum pellucidum. Uh, we don't see the corpus callosum there. And look, the hemispheres are continuous. So these are holoprosencephaly malformation. Holoprosencephaly may have some facial stigmata like these ones, especially the extreme form of uh, holoprosencephaly which we call aloba holoprosencephaly. In aloba holoprosencephaly, you may have even the midline structure of the face being affected, as you can see in these particular children, where you have even fusion of the two eyes attempting to happen. The nose, there's a problem there, even in this one. So they may have facial stigmata. If a child is born with some kind of facial stigmata of the midline structures, pink, of a possibility of having a holoprosencephaly spectrum of malformations. Other than that, we also have disorders that affect the corpus callosum. Now, the corpus callosum may be completely absent, and that is what we call callosal agenesis. But it may be present except with some disorders, and we call that one callosal dysgenesis. When you have callosal dysgenesis, it could be that it is too tiny, like what we see in the first image. We call that callosal hypoplasia, hypoplasia of the corpus callosum. Or it may have a small defect within it. We call that focal segmental defect. It may also have been truncated, like what we see in the middle image. So that's a truncation. This is also a truncation. So truncation means one side has been cut off. So understand, we may have hypoplasia of the corpus callosum. We may have focal segmental defect. We can have also truncation of the corpus callosum. The other anomaly of ventral induction is this one, which we call microcephaly. It means a small head. And this small head is because there's a small brain. So this is still disorders of ventral induction. It's a problem with the swelling of the vesicles of the brain. So you have microcephaly. We call it microcephaly if um, the head circumference is below three standard deviations or less than three standard deviations of normal. Uh, this is showing us hydranencephaly. Don't confuse this with hydrocephaly. Hydranencephaly 
is where the prosencephalon has been replaced with water. It has undergone liquefaction. The skull is intact, the size looks fine, but the forebrain is not there. It's completely not there or partially absent. And the part that is not there has been replaced with water. We call that hydranencephaly. Not so compatible life. Usually in this one, the brainstem and uh, cerebellum will remain intact, but uh, the hemispheres are the ones which have undergone liquefaction. Then you can have disorders of, do of cortical development. These are disorders of neuronal proliferation, migration, and cortical organization. Uh, we'll capture a few. One of them is this one, where you see very smooth brain. It means that the gyral circle patterns are fewer. So the brain appear relatively smoother than usual. We call that lysencephaly. In imaging, we note that in lysencephaly, the cerebral cortex is relatively thick compared to the normal one. See so that thickened cerebral cortex, and we see that the sulco patterns are very few. So there are less convolutions. It can be global, like in this brain, first, the, the, the second image, the third image there, or the first MRI image. Or it could be partial, like in the last image there, where we see posteriorly there is lysencephaly, but the rest we can see normal brain convolutions. We may also have what we call hemimegaencephaly. Hemimegaencephaly result from overgrowth of one of the hemispheres. So there is overgrowth of one hemisphere. Like this one, the right hemisphere, the right hemisphere, the right hemisphere, the right hemisphere is overgrown. Overgrowth of right of one hemisphere is termed hemimegaencephaly. Other than that, we may also have uh, several tiny gyri. What we call polymicrogyri is what we are seeing on that image there. In polymicrogyri, they are numerous convolutions, excessive convolutions of the brain. Uh, because of that, the cerebral cortex is also very irregular. So there's some regions which are thicker than others. It's an irregular thickening of the cerebral cortex. We can talk about posterior fossa malformations. Posterior fossa malformations are malformations that affect the posterior cranial fossa. Remember, posterior cranial fossa houses the cerebellum and the brain stem. Uh, the fourth ventricle is also within the posterior cranial fossa. Now, the one being shown here is called Dandy Walker malformation. In Dandy Walker malformation, there are three things involved. One, the cerebellar vermis may either be absent or tiny. These images show us a tiny cerebellar vermis. So, these are small vermis, but could also be completely absent. The second thing is that there's a cyst within the uh, posterior cranial fossa that extends from the fourth ventricle. You can call that cystic dilatation of the fourth ventricle. And because of that cyst, we have a third component of the syndrome. The third component is that now that cyst causes the posterior cranial fossa to expand massively as you can see this one. And so the posterior cranial fossa is expanded and it's evidenced by raising of this point. That point is called the tocula. The tocula is where the superior sagittal sinus meet, meet with the straight sinus and also the transverse sinuses. So the tocula is raised. Usually it's around here. Now this is now upwardly elevated. So tocula elevation, signifying enlargement of the posterior cranial fossa. Then we have cystic dilatation of the fourth ventricle that causes the enlargement. And we have vermal agenesis or dysgenesis constitute dandy walker malformation. The other malformation, okay, so this is still dandy walker malformation still. <clears throat> 
uh, similar to what I've just shown in the previous image. Other than dandy walker malformation, we can still have carry malformation. Remember, I already highlighted on carry malformation as downward herniation of the posterior cranial fossa structures through foramen magnum. Mm -hmm. The one we discussed under neural tube disorders was carry two. This was another carry that's called carry one. Again, still downward displacement. And these are the ones I'm showing here, carry one malformations. One of the key differences between carry one and carry two is that in carry two, there was spinal dystrophic disorder. In carry one, we don't necessarily have a spinal dystrophic disorder. But instead, we usually have a CSF pocket within the spinal cord, what we call syrinx or syringomelia. And that's the syrinx, this is the syrinx here, that's the syrinx there. In this one, it's dark, that's the syrinx, and this one's also dark, that's the syrinx. There's a CSF pocket within the spinal cord, but there's also downward herniation of the posterior cranial fossa structures. The other posterior fossa malformation is this one where the cerebellar hemispheres are continuous and we do not have the cerebellar vermis. So there's no cerebellar vermis and the right and left cerebellar hemispheres are continuous. We call this one rhombencephalosynapsis. Lastly, malformations that affect the ventricular system. Top on the list is the common concept of hydrocephaly, which means a lot of fluid within the brain ventricles. Different from hydranencephaly, replacement of the forebrain with water. So hydrocephaly is a common manifestation of a number of disorders. I'm mentioning it on its own because it's one of the commonest things that you'll see in newborn babies, hydrocephaly. Could be caused by a number of things. So the congenital causes could be mostly stenosis at the level of the cerebral aqueduct or at the level of the foramen of Monroe or the exit foramina from the fourth ventricle for a number of reasons. You can also have intraventricular hemorrhages, which have clots and so causing this kind of uh, anomalies. You may have it as an isolated thing or part of a syndrome generally. So in imaging, we see dilatation of the ventricles as we can see in the first image and even the second image there. In this second image, there is asymmetric enlargement of the ventricles with the posterior dominance, that the posterior horns of the lateral ventricles are the ones which are predominantly enlarged compared to the anterior horns. This one has a name, we call it colpocephaly. It's a, just a specific type of ventriculomegaly. The last one is called schizencephaly. In schizencephaly, there's a problem with the development of the cerebral hemisphere, in which case there's a cleft through the hemisphere. That cleft communicates the ventricular space, lateral ventricle in this case, with the subarachnid space. So we call that schizencephaly. Great. So that is a summary I wanted to give you on development and congenital malformations of the central nervous system. Thank you very much.